Hi, welcome to the Pole Shift News, guys. Before we begin, a big thanks to Brian out there. You know who you are, I'm not going to mention your surname, but um, that was very nice what you've done over the weekend. And I took your advice, I took me and my partner out, and um, it was nice just to get my face uh, through the water and take some air and just feel like a normal human being. You know, um, I know some of you uh, have been following me over the last few months. I know that I've been, um, you know, making every effort to get back into some form of reasonable employment over here in the UK, uh, as I'm sure a lot of people are facing at the moment, as where I am. It's not easy out there. But, uh, big thanks to Joe, who encouraged me to uh, re-examine my CV, and that's what I did. And, um, you know, we're getting some interviews now, so hopefully it won't be long. And just because I'm looking for permanent employment doesn't mean that um, I'll be dropping what we do here on the channel uh, because I'm very interested in taking it even further than what we are, uh, especially with uh, linking the data that we collect from the servers um, or at least the sensors and having that uh, go straight up to the internet and log the data live on this website. Uh, we're just on the Earth's magnetic field, but we're on Pole Shift News. Um, you know, if you haven't been on there yet, guys, please go over there and have a look. It's a good website. It covers most of the geomagnetic anomalies that are taking place, as well as other um, anomalies, such as we cover live solar data, earthquakes. Uh, we've got live satellite feeds of the Earth. We've got live volcano maps and lots of other stuff, like space weather and things like that. It's, you know, I'm trying to make it as interesting as possible for people and you know and not only that to bring the awareness of the um, you know the major anomaly that we're in in my view right now which is the Earth's magnetic field um, reversing and all that comes along with that as I see it as one of being as being one of the most uh, critical planetary mechanic systems that affects everything else uh, down the line, such as climate. Um, I redid the experiment, so this is the fourth time now we've done this experiment, so I'll run the uh, little video clip that I did of that, and I think it's self-explanatory, so uh, let's get on with it. This is the fourth atmospheric oxygen test that we've done. Um, I've let it run since Saturday, so Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, it's had three days, or 36 hours or more um, to go through the um, or complete the reaction. I'm going to let it run a little longer. Uh, we've had just marginal better results as you can see. It's at 16% uh, the atmospheric oxygen and you know I still think there's plenty of steel wall to oxidize. The other thing I did do is before I reset the experiment back up I just wanted to know if we had still a capacity to convert uh, the oxygen into oxide in the uh, precipitated uh, oh, sorry the graduated uh, test tube so what I did is I just drained the water out and plunged it back into the tank and what I got was over about two hours was still further reaction and this is an indication that the um, mild acid in this case the vinegar, uh, still had enough agent to work on oxidizing the uh, new tube of oxygen. So what this tells us is that two things, uh, the steel wall wasn't all consumed in the reaction and neither was um, the uh, mild acid uh, consumed or run flat basically. So I know that there is plentiful even now uh, of uh, steel and uh, mild acid to create more reaction but what I think is taking place here although you can see a bit of a tide mark on this it's not very clear but it is at 16% I'll try and zoom right in so that you can see actually the liquid inside is at the 16% mark there's two marks uh, to get 20% and each mark represents 2% so only marginally better after this uh, fourth test of the atmosphere <clears throat> to see the atmospheric oxygen content. So 
Still not 20% or 21% like we wanted. I will let this run to the death, you know, probably a whole week if it needs to. But what I think is happening is because of the uh, weakness of the acid that we're using, the uh, vinegar in this case, uh, I think when it consumes, say, 12% of the atmospheric oxygen in the tube, it then takes a lot longer to capture and run the... Um, you know, uh, the oxidation to the completion of all the oxygen in this tube. It takes a lot longer to do that. So I will, um, you know, do another update on this at the end of the week. And the only other thing I wanted to talk about in this video was uh, a look at how I was thinking of building an oxygen analyzer, uh, something that we could um, possibly add to already the observatory uh, that now monitors the um, magnetosphere and the uh, tracking and heading of the uh, migrating North Pole. So one of the sensors that I've been looking at um, to build the electronic oxygen sensor is I've been thinking about converting the Lambda sensor on a car which is it's an oxygen sensor. Uh, the only thing that's putting me off about this is that it has to heat up some metal uh, in order to get a reaction going uh, with the copper filament in there. <clears throat> and the way it works is that the oxygen ion hits it and generate, you know, the amount of oxygen ions that hit it generate a small electric current. And depending on how much oxygen is being converted in this little reaction in the Lambda sensor, gives uh, a higher or lower voltage. So this is one of the um, things that I've been looking at and I've come across a couple of other guys that have uh, built ox their own oxygen sensors using Lambda sensors and other sensors and there's a bit more to it. I mean, because they do read from 0 .0, 0, uh, 0 0.1 volts to 0 0.9 volts, it's such a small thing to try and um, get like an accurate uh, reading in between them. Uh, you have to add uh, another electronic component off the top of my head, I can't think of the name of it now, but you know what I'm saying is it's not out of the capabilities, but at the moment um, it's just a case of having time. Most of my time is being uh, taken up at the moment trying to get some um, permanent work. Um, but that's something I'm thinking of also adding to our uh, observatory here uh, because I think it's well worth. Uh, monitoring the levels of oxygen, especially at a time where we're consuming a lot of oxygen um, in uh, the various processes of modern day technology. <clears throat> so I didn't want to go on too long today in this video, um, you know, just to put a few people's uh, mind at ease. I'm not going anywhere. I'm still going to be doing the channel, and you know, it is nice um, when we get support for. Uh, what we're doing here and you know I really think um, you know many people internationally even though we've only got a small audience are getting something uh, from what we put out on this channel on the website and with the data that we're collecting I think for some people it is peace of mind you know yes we might have only um, achieved you know results of you know, 16 to 18 percent with this oxygen uh, recent oxygen test. Um, th th there's one other thing I've got to mention. If we go into the electronic um, uh, oxygen testers, then we've got to calibrate it at something. Um, just because it gives a reading, you still have to tell the computer what that reading is uh, at and what the levels are, and it's part of the calibration. So you know, we need. Um, probably a better method than what we're using now, even though this is a, a, a tried and tested laboratory method to determine how much oxygen is in the atmosphere. We still will need at some point a benchmark and it will come from one of those experiments that we've been conducting over the last few days uh, to give us that uh, amount that we can calibrate by. So if it is 18% 18 in the atmosphere and we're not getting 20% then that's exactly what we calibrate the uh, electronic sensor at, but at least we know from that point on if it depletes any more than that and it continues uh, depleting, uh, we know that you know it's not because there's an error, it's because it actually is uh, reducing in the atmospheric uh, content of the oxygen. So, guys, there's a link down there if you want to support the channel, um, and 
or somewhere I usually do. You know, enjoy your week, and uh, I'll be back at some point this week uh, with a with another update. We're about to pull the SD cards out of both the magnetometer and the um, magnetosphere sensor, and we'll add that up to the uh, website that we've got up there already. So if you want to, uh, over the next few days, pop along to Pole Shift News for that data then uh, please feel free. One other thing, someone asked me um, where the poles will be when the next pole reversal takes place. It is really anybody's guess, uh, and that is because we don't quite know what it is that's going on in the magneto in the Earth's crust, um, in the centre of the Earth. We don't know really what generates the magnetic field, it, despite um, many attempts for it to be try and recreated in the laboratory environment, we just don't know. Um, I can say this: it could end up somewhere in Siberia, the New South Pole, uh, if it is a complete reversal. And when it does reverse, and it, the South Pole does end up somewhere in Siberia, which it looks like it could possibly be, uh, it's going to be a hundred years for it to go back to its original settled position after that point. That's if we have. Uh, that is an ordinary and usual magnetic reversal, but there is something different about this one. If you remember, it's 500 year, 500,000 years overdue. So um, there you go, guys. Something to think about, anyhow, at least. Um, I'll say what I usually do. Link below, and as always, bye for now.